Good morning, Mr. Wayne Hubbard. I'm the music minister at First United Methodist Church. Glad to be with you again for another of our Methodist moments, our Sunday school lessons that we gather here um, each Sunday morning to uh, hear a message from God's Word. And um, ours come from the international series of lessons, and um, the uh, where once again we're in the Old Testament. Before we get started, I want to say Happy Mother's Day. It's not too late to call or go and visit um, someone who has been important in your life. Make that call. You know, today we're having a, a Mother's Day brunch, even as we're speaking right now. I'm recording this on Saturday. And um, in, in a church setting, there are, are many who might be a mother or a father in the faith. I had many teachers who... Uh, who were were uh, like parents. They weren't parents, but they were like parents in the fact that they had a great influence on me in growing in the faith. And so um, take that time today to give someone a call. Uh, today, uh, like I said, we're going to continue our study in the Old Testament. Uh, we're looking at this unit on being good stewards. And I know that any of you who were raised in the church know any discussion of stewardship will eventually get around to what? Tithing. And this one does too. Today. Today we look at Deuteronomy chapter 14. And in this scripture, we see references to tithing, commands actually, to tithing. Well, what does tithing mean? If you're not from a church situation. Tithing literally means giving a tenth. A tenth is a tithe. And so uh, I want to start out today with a with a little story from our, our student book. And it talks about, about tithing and the difficulty with understanding tithing. Um, the author of our Sunday school lesson put this in as a, like a personal testimony about tithing. And in it, this, this teacher says, in a former church, the chair of one of our ministry teams refused to tithe her money. She explained to me that she gave a great deal of volunteer time to the church, which she did. Thus, my friend did not see the purpose in giving money in addition to the many hours she spent working for the church. I sought to convince her otherwise. As one of her pastors, I launched into my spiel about the vital importance of meeting our budget. I blatantly said to her, we greatly appreciate your talents, but if everyone followed your example, we would not be able to keep the church doors open. My pleas fell on deaf ears. She was adamant in her belief that her only tithing obligation was that of time and talent. It dawned on me that my approach to her had been ineffective but I was uncertain how to convince her about the importance of tithing. That all changed when a United Methodist financial consultant led a workshop on stewardship at their church. He advised church leaders and the church financial committee members not to heap a sense of guilt or shame on church members about their obligations to give in order to meet the budget. He informed us that parishioners appeared more willing to give when they envision working through the church rather than simply doling out money to the church. I think we all would agree with that, wouldn't we? It was all a matter of perspective, he proclaimed. He clarified for us exactly what he meant. When people hold the attitude that they're given to the church and nothing more, in their minds, they're only sustaining the institution. We're having some institutional problems in the Methodist church. However, when they perceive of their money as empowering ministry, they're more willing to hand over their hard-earned cash with joy and trust. Furthermore, he led us to picture earning, giving, saving, and spending money as spiritual decisions. Thanking God for our blessings allows us to worship God and not the money. He suggests that spiritual growth and tithing are linked together when we tithe we focus on God as the source of our strength. No longer do our achievements or financial assets rule over us. 
giving frees us from the bondage money often holds in our lives. I realized that I had instructed this church leader in the wrong way. I had challenged her to give out of a sense of guilt. I had centered her thoughts on meeting the budget of the church rather than directing her to consider the ministries accomplished through faithful tithing. I failed to help her understand tithing as a spiritual practice. However, she just happened to be present when this consultant spoke in our church. She listened to his words carefully and took them to heart. He helped change her approach to tithing. She began to practice it monetarily by setting aside money for the church. Together with her other means of service, she pledged her loyalty to God. Wow. So, Today, so the, the student book also has this scripture from Deuteronomy. And this is where the actual command comes from. It comes from, from Moses, from God through Moses to the Israelites. So let's read, read our scripture for today. It's Deuteronomy 14, 20 through, 22 through 29. You must reserve a tenth part of whatever your fields produce you produce each year. Eat the tenth part of your grain, wine, oil, oldest offspring of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God in the location he selects for his name to reside so that you learn to fear the Lord your God at all times. Kind of unpack that for just a second. This command says you're going to take your tenth and you're going to go to the place where God has said, this is where I am. Remember the tent of the tabernacle, later on the temple. Take that tent there and eat it there as a, um, an offering to the Lord. But if the trip is too long because the location the Lord your God has selected to put his name is far away from where you live so that you can't transport the tenth part, because this could be, grain, uh, money, livestock that you're having to do, then, then the command says in verse 25, then you can convert it to money, take the money with you and go to the location the Lord your God selects. Then you can use the money for anything you want, cattle, sheep, wine, beer, or whatever else you might like. Then you should feast there and celebrate in the presence of the Lord your God along with your entire household. Only make sure not to neglect the Levites. We talked about the Levites last week. Levites who are living in your cities because they don't have a designated inheritance like you. He continues, every third year you must bring the tenth part of your produce from that year and leave it at your city gates. Then the Levites, who have no designated inheritance like you do, along with immigrants, orphans, and widows who live in your cities, will come and feast until they are full. Do this so that the Lord your God might bless you in everything you do. So it's really two commands. Year one, take your tenth to the place the Lord has designated. Year two, take your tenth to the place the Lord has designated. Year three, take your tenth to a place in the city where the poor, the orphans, the widows, the travelers, the immigrants, and the Levites, the ones who are in the church, have a place that they can, can also take a part in this feast for the Lord. Sounds pretty complicated. It's real foreign to our um, Western ears, isn't it? It's very foreign to me to hear that, um, that description. But as we dive into the text, we see four reasons for, tith for tithing that are in this text. Number one, everything belongs to God. We talked last week about that, that being a shared understanding of the earth with the Native Americans. Native Americans believed everything belonged 
to God. Every, it was not theirs. They're passing through. And we are not sharing, when we share the tenth, we're not sharing something that is ours with the Lord because the Lord doesn't need anything. We're simply giving back a tenth to him because it's all his anyway. Number two, giving our tithe is part of the covenant agreement. The covenant that God has made with the Israelites, the covenant God has made with us. Give a tenth, I will be your God. Are we people of our word? If we've joined in this covenant, and we've said we're going to share our gifts and our presence and our our witness and our um, understanding. We're going to share all of these things and our tenth of what, the, what we have. When we made that commitment, did we mean it? Is our word true? To believe, do we believe that God's word is true? Because the last verse says, do this so that the Lord your God might bless you in everything you do. Do we believe God is going to bless us in everything he does? Number three, tithing shows that we understand that God is God and we are not. Do we understand that? Do we believe that? Do we really truly believe that God is God and we are not? It's kind of an important thing. Tithing shows our reverence for God, the being that we are not. The fourth, tithing results in God's blessing. You know, we've all heard stories, we all know stories of people who end up being blessed or get stuff after tithing. My grandmother, perfect example, was a, um, the, the secretary at First Baptist Church in Gina, Louisiana, godly woman, tithed her whole life and never wanted for anything. Told the story. She went to, she went to Hawaii two times. She had different um, things paid for. She had no idea who paid for them. Someone in her church would find out she needed something and they knew the godly woman she was and it would get paid for. She was the secretary at the church. We know that. But there's also stories aren't there, of missionaries going forth or disaster relief being delivered by groups like UMCOR, the United Methodist Commission on Relief, or Mission Carthage. Things that our churches do because people have shared their tithe with the church. If the people did not share their tithe, those things would never, ever happen. Blessing others is a double blessing. What do we mean by that? It's a, ble a blessing for the for person who's receiving the gift, the money, the food, the housing, the gas, the whatever it is that they need. It's a blessing to them. It's also a blessing to the person who's giving the gift. It's a double blessing. The giver and the receiver are both blessed. We have a story in in our our book from from uh, John Wesley. John Wesley, great, um, of course, the founder of the Methodist Church, a great um, leader in our church. And uh, John Wesley um, had a sermon called "The Use of Money," and he preached to the Methodists um, of his time by invoking them these things: earn all you can save all you can, and give all you can. It's pretty great, isn't it? He learned this one time when he had gone to buy some things for the walls of his office, and the person coming in that was the, the um, custodian was cleaning it, and she's shivering because she doesn't have proper clothing. And his question was, will thy master say, well done, good and faithful servant? Thou hast adorned thy walls with the money that might have screened this poor creature from the cold. O justice, O mercy, are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid? So what did he do? 
John Wesley decided he was going to live on the least amount of money that he could. And he was going to save the most amount of money he could and give it to others. When he died, he had probably made more money, earned more money than anyone in his time. He had preached, received offerings. He, he died with essentially a few dollars in his pocket, a silver spoon that he could eat with, and the clothes on his back. And he was the richest man in England at the time. He lived this sermon, Will God Say, Well Done, Good and Faithful Servant. After we have taken care of our basic needs and those of our family, we can be generous with what remains. Wesley said, Render unto God not a tenth, not a third, not a half, but all that is God's. As we said last week, you truly can't take it with you. Don't go and try to serve God and money. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You're going to hate one and love the other. So what does he say? He says, serve God first. Serve God first. You can't serve God in wealth. So how do we do it? Put God first and listen to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to you. You'll be guided in the right way. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this message that leads us to give. Help us to give not only with our time, but also with these blessings you pour down on us. Help us to be a blessing to someone else who's in need today. In your name we pray. Amen. Again, happy Mother's Day. We'll see you next week for another of our Methodist Moments.